So we're set with that. So this is the second of our editor training series, and I'm going to be making this available um, on YouTube after we're done so that anyone who is unable to attend can view it. Um, I did want to let you know some kind of big news from my end. Um, my husband just got a job in Chicago, so I'm going to be moving to Chicago the middle of next week. Um, I'm going to continue on with the foundation, but I think that there may be some changes. Um, we'll be hiring a content development associate who is going to be handling more of the day-to-day -day content coordination uh, issues. And uh, for the near term, I'll you know still be working very closely with all of you, but this may change as soon as we hire this new individual as they would take on um, overseeing all the editing. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that that might be a change coming up in the not so distant future. So let's see. Um, I'm going to try to share my desktop. Can you see what's going on here? Okay, I saw that from Aaron. Um, perfect. Okay, so I have opened a brand new Philosophy 304 course, um, and I should mention if you guys have any comments or questions, feel free to just ask them to me in the chat pane, um, and I'll try to get to them as quickly as I can. And I thought today I'd just kind of walk you through what I look for when I'm opening a new draft. Um, this is a brand new, as I said, a brand new blueprint um, from a new consultant. So he'll probably take a bit more training than usual. Um, the first thing is, this shouldn't be here. Um, the title is just the title of the course. We label all the files themselves by the course titles. Something minor, but it is part of our protocol. Um, and then I usually read through the introduction, the purpose of course, twice. The first time I read through for grammar and mechanical issues, and the second time I read through for, you know, thinking more about issues of tone and audience. So I'm not going to bore you by actually line editing the whole document here, but I think we should focus just on this opening paragraph quickly. The first thing that st stands out to me is obviously this missing space and that there's only one space after each period. Those are very easy, obvious ones. So for the space after each period, I just go to replace Go look for all single spaces and replace with a double. And then you just have to look out for any cases where there might have already been two spaces. So then I'll go in and look for any instances of, OK, so there are none of those. So that's done. The other thing I'll say is that I constantly am saving my work because it's very easy to lose track and lose your work. Um, so I save that. Okay, so let's dig into this. Existentialism is a philosophical and literary movement popularized after World War II by figures such as John Paul Sartre and Albert Camus in France. I think that's a pretty good opener because it quickly identifies what the key term is. Um, I'm very averse to passive voice, so I don't really like the idea of popularized by, but if he doesn't do that very often, I'll probably leave it as is. So the roots of this movement, however, are arguable, but are arguable, but can be traced back either to the religious writings of Blaise Pascal. Da da da. Um, I don't understand what the however is here because he's not really saying this in contradistinction to anything previous. So I probably take that out. It can be traced back to the religious writings. Blah blah. blah. I would probably take out these unnecessary commas. Okay, common thread that unites existentialists is a focus on existence. And again, over comma. So at this point, I know that I'm going to be looking very carefully for an overuse of commas. The concrete is human being. Unlike rationalists, all right, there's a typo here. Thinkers like Rene Descartes and JW. See, and now that I added the double space, you have to be careful about things like periods there. So. Um, I would keep my eyes out for that. And I just realized that this of each individual human being can be deleted. 
Um, let me pause and just see if there have been any comments over here in the window. Okay, good point, Tina. I see that the spelling out of the centuries. Good catch. So I will change that. Sarah, I saw that you were typing as well, so I'll wait to see what you say before I move on. Oops. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, form proper names, do we need to look up accent marks for those? I would generally say yes. Um, the more detailed you can be, the better. Um, in this case, I know that the spelling of these both are correct just because I happen to know that content. Um, but I think that's a good point to check up on those. Um, yeah. Sorry, Steve, I just saw you wrote something. Let me open this up. This is a little bit hard to switch between. Okay. Steve, it might be helpful to edit that with markup turned on so that everyone can more easily see the extra spaces, softer turns, etc. Would you all like me? I mean, this is that's not typically how we actually edit. Um, but for this case, would that be helpful for everyone to see that? Okay, I'll turn on track changes. Ah, let's see if I can move, I can zoom in anymore. Yes. Can you guys see that better? Okay, perfect. All right, so let's get back to this. Um, okay, so I think we were, okay, unlike rationalist thinkers like Rene Descartes and J.W. Hegel, G.W. Hegel, existentialists reject the claim that human beings are merely rational thinking creatures. Again, the overuse of comma. Existentialists thus look at human experience in its totality. It includes consideration of, okay, this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, when we have a pronoun with an unclear antecedent, I think that here you could be, it could refer to human experience, but I think um, he's obviously referring to existentialism. So I would probably leave him a comment and just say, can you clarify, oops, clarify the antecedent? Existential. Let's look at the human experience in its totality. If he's saying existentialism includes consideration of the human being's body, social space, the role of freedom, human anxiety about death, God, or the absence of God. So this laundry list is already confusing to me since it's not really um, constructed in a way that, I mean, for example, the human being's body, social space, the role of freedom. For me, it seems like you're saying the human being's body, the human being's social space, the human being's the role of freedom. So I would probably just invert this. So consideration of social space, human being's body, the role of freedom, human anxiety about death, God, and I would probably merge these two, God or the absence of God, and the very human suspicion that we have been thrown into a world that we did not create and everything which that thought entails. Um, this is fine. The only thing I, I think I would, I mean, it's a really hefty sentence, but um, so I, that kind of gives me a pause, but I'm gonna keep going and see if, you know, on reflection of looking at this overall introduction, if I think it makes sense. Um, the only thing I would say is I don't really like the phrase existentialism includes consideration of. I would probably encourage him to put considers um, just to avoid unnecessary uh, verbiage. Let's move on. In this course, we will take a historical look at the existentialist movement. So this seems to me like a new thought. He's kind of zooming back out to the high level, so I might interrupt this and put it in a separate paragraph. So we'll take a historical look at the existentialist movement. We'll look at, this is a repetition of the phrase look at, so I'd probably say we will study the work of, blah, 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 all these names. Okay, 
And Sarah, yes, at this point, I would probably spend a little bit of time like looking up on, you know, just Googling to make sure that these spellings are all correct. I would also encourage him to put, since he uses some first names and some just last names, I would, well, let me make sure I have this little O. I would make that the pattern here. Okay, and then this can be part of this paragraph since it's still talking about, oh, do I have a message down here? Hold on, let me see if I have a question. Okay, Susan, should we change we will to you will? We will not grant blah, blah, blah. Yep, um, I am completely in agreement with that. Let's change that aspect. We will, oh, you know, we will is fine. I, the only thing that I'm really, we will and you will is fine. The only thing that I would change in this phrase is as such successful completion of the course means that this should be you. We should never be referring to the students because we're trying to make a personal connection with all of our students here. So we want to make sure that anytime you can directly address the student and his or her experience, you are. So I would just change that portion. But we will is perfectly fine. I actually think that um, that can be almost more encouraging to students. Let me pause and see what Sarah said. How do you make the call between whether to suggest the consultant make a change or just doing it yourself? The consultant seems like a pretty good writer, but I'm editing something right now where I'm not sure how efficiently. So Sarah, that's a great question. And it honestly takes time to figure out what the ins and outs of each consultant is like. I tend to err more on the side of changing what I think needs to be changed up front as opposed to, you know, as long as you know it's not impacting the meaning. Um, I encourage you to take that on yourself. Um, if you get the sense that the writer is particularly good, you might instead flag it and mention it um, and leave it to them. But I tend to err on the side of correcting things myself and improving things myself. But that's a really good question and it can be a hard judgment call. Um, okay, so successful completion of the course means that you will be able to recognize the manner in which existentialism is reaction and at times rejection. Okay, already the sentence has lost me. So you will be able to recognize the manner in which existentialism is reaction. So I think that that's a really confusing phrase. So I would probably just flag the rest of this sentence. Rejection and leave a comment. Um, I would probably say the phrasing here gives me pause. Um, the construction existentialism is reaction and at times rejection of feels vague, um, lofty to me in a way that may alienate and confuse students. So I would probably just flag that and ask him is there a way to reframe? All right, and note that I'm constantly saving my work. I just did it again. Okay, and then most importantly, um, I would just take that out and say, you, upon, com well, let's see. We want to make sure that they still preserve the idea that upon completion, Let's see if that makes sense. A such successful completion of the course means that you will be able to blah, blah. I think that's fine. I think that still preserves the idea that upon completion, um, students will be able to demonstrate certain things. So most importantly, you will be able to recognize what existential thinkers have contributed to our understanding of human existence and the human's place in the cosmos. Missing a period. So let's think back on this more broadly. I'm, I think that this is actually a pretty solid introduction. I think he identifies the, term, the key term. He brings up the key figures, and you get a sense that we're going to be approaching this by looking at key thinkers in the movement um, from a historical vantage. Um, I think he identifies the principal goals. So I think this overall is a very solid introduction, and I don't think that I would change much. Again, once he's, I've passed this back for this first round of edits, once he's cleaned this up,
up and you see what it looks like after he's improved certain aspects, it may be that I go back and say, you know, on second look, I think that you need to tease out the term existentialism or, you know, this package of, you know, students will be looking at human experience in its totality and then considering all of these different concepts. That feels like a lot that we're packing in. I might ask him to tease that out a little bit more. But on this first pass, I'm tr just trying to make sure that the major components are in place. So let me pause and check for comments. Okay, Sarah. Oh, no. Okay. All right, we're all good. Does anyone have any questions right now before I go back to the... Okay, Sarah, to go back to the you versus the student, but do we use you even for learning outcomes? I remember that being the one instance where I kept student in. Yes, this is bizarre, I know, but we, because we've built so many courses and we are using the student construction and the outcomes, we have preserved that because we don't want to have to go back and change every single one. I know that's a little bit inconsistent, but that is how just been the protocol we've used. But everywhere else, Sarah, we should be using you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, let's move on to learning outcomes. Upon successful completion of this course, the student will be able to. This is minor, but I always change this to periods, which is the standard way that we do this in all of our courses. I've also already noticed a few indentation issues, so I go through and correct this. Um, at this point, I usually take a look. If this is the first time I'm opening a blueprint, I'll go back here at this point to see the um, course design worksheet. So let me minimize this briefly and go here. Let me blow this up. Hold on. Can you guys see that okay? Okay, good. Um, at this point, I'll kind of take a look. I see he's thought about this a bit. Okay, no is obviously already a problem um, as a key action item for learning outcomes. It's really hard to assess whether a student quote unquote knows something. So we try to aim for more concrete, um, measurable outcomes like identify, list, um, differentiate between those types of, you know, very easy to assess action items. All right, so I'm going to scroll down and take a look at First of all, I kind of glance and make sure he's actually done his homework to see what some others, how some others have approached the challenge of course design. I noticed here that he put my name, so I'm thinking that this might be an error. So I'll probably ask him a question about that because I, as far as I know, I don't teach a course at Yale. Um, okay, looks like he's done his homework. Has some good ideas of who he wants to address. Found some good resources, and this is something we can look at more closely once we come into the pairing portion. Okay, so it looks like he's really thought through the different outcomes he'd like students to meet. And he's focusing on knowledge, so content recall, analysis, and evaluation. And you can see he has this handy little, you know, level related list of outcomes. So I can see that he's really tried to tie these to different goals he has for his students, which is great. So with that in mind, revisiting this, I can see that he's really put some thought into these, which is great. Um, I do think the idea of appraising the value of existentialism in modern society is a very tall order. So I think I would probably flag these um, and mention that to them. These feel like tall orders to me. How do we assess this type of appraisal, this type of thinking? Are there more specific action items we can add here to make this more measurable? 
Um, and I think just flagging those and indicating what your concerns are are fine. You don't need to be take on the onus of actually coming up with what a revised outcome might be. Sometimes it just, I mean, he seems like a very bright guy, so I'm sure he'll come up with some alternative. So let's take a look. So identify is a great one, I think. That's obvious. You can imagine how you would assess that. Recognize the basic tenants. This is a little bit dicier. Um, I might ping him a little bit on this and say, what specific assessment do you have in mind for this one? Just to see what he says. He could very well have a very good idea of how to assess this, but I would ask. Differentiate seems practical. Um, you can imagine a student picking, you know, having to answer a short answer or selecting a multiple choice that in indicates which approach relates to which different philosophies. So I think more or less those are okay. Okay, and I'm not going to go through each and every single unit below because we would be here for quite a bit. Um, let me pause and see if there have been any other comments. Anyone else have a question before I skim through the rest? Okay, good. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the pros here, but I'll just tell you when I'm looking at this very quickly what stands out to me. Um, I might ask him to be a little bit more, well, let's see if he names all of his units after. Okay, so he's organized all of these units by uh, thinker, which is fine. So I was going to say if they weren't all organized by thinker, I might try to have him add a tail that explains why Blaze is so important here. But since he doesn't, that's fine. Um, just in a brief skimming of this, this, these phrases stick out to me as being you know, finitude and contingency are kind of big loaded terms that need some sort of gloss. So this quickly directs my attention. Um, I think that these terms need a quick gloss. I would flag that very quickly. Um, the other thing that that phrase sticks out to me is that it seems like the rest of his prose is very approachable, but this seems very high level. So honestly, that, that kind of change in tone sometimes makes me wonder, and this is, you know, I don't mean to be offensive to anyone, especially not the author, but sometimes when I see a quick change in tone like this, I'll wonder if this wasn't kind of pulled from another article or something. So I might just do a quick Google and look, you know, copy this phrase and look it up on Google and see if it shows up in any article. I won't do that now, but if it, you know, shows up in Wikipedia, for example, then I would flag that and tell me need to change it. So I would keep my eye out for any kind of changes in tone. Okay, so let's finish skimming through this. Obviously, I, I always take a look at anything that appears, you know, that Microsoft Word tags as incorrect grammar. I think that, that was, that's fine, but those quickly attract my eye. Um, Pensees is the name of a work, and it needs to be set apart as such. I also, I'm not going to go through this, but I see a ton of comments and uh, commas in this last couple lines. I would read that very carefully to avoid over comma use because we already identified that as a problem area in the beginning. Um, and then here, I would again, oops, change this to appear as I like it to appear. Um, go through and manually edit that. Okay, I'm not going to do all that um, here. And then I would again spend some time thinking about how each of these might be assessed. Define, that's fine. Recognize that I might flag again and say, you know, how specifically do you imagine assessing this? Do you mean listing? Do you mean, you know, identifying? Do you mean explaining? Um, recognize can mean so many different things. Analyze is another hard one, but I know that his, one of his key focuses in his course design worksheet was analysis, so I might be okay with that, but I would probably in my global feedback to him in my email mention, you know, you how do you envision assessing this? Do you imagine adding, you know, critical thinking 
essays um, and kind of just make sure he has that in the back of his mind. This would probably need to be in quotation marks because I think that that's like a phrase that should be set apart. Otherwise, who knows what wa this wager is. Assess is a good one. That's fine. Except for assess the value of. That, that gives me pause. So that kind of gets back to his whole emphasis on appraising, assessing, um, and analysis. I'd really push him in my global feedback to think through assessment strategies for these types of global and higher level thinking skills. I know that these are important. Sorry, let me pause. I just saw a note from Aaron. Does it seem odd that 1.1 is an overview of existentialism with a new? Yes, let's get to that quickly. Um, yes, that would flag my attention. I would probably say this seems misplaced. Do you want to put this as a pre-unit? You know, just have a, and that's something we can do even before you get to unit one. We have something called a pre-unit, so you can put important key touchstone readings there. So I'd probably say bring that up. I won't type it all out here, but I'll say, should this be presented in a pre-unit before the actual units begin? The other thing that flags my attention is all of these need to be in title case. One of the things I notice a lot is that we often forget to put is in the title case because I think it looks like in or something like that, and is should be in the title case. Founders. And I actually think you can already tell he's looking at these little pieces of content in a very detailed, organized way, and I really like it. Um, I like the idea that he has this primary point on just providing the definition, who is included. This feels like a little bit of a vague title to me, so I might add in existentialism. Or, and then may, or maybe flag it and say, is there any way you can make this more specific? Um, and I would probably add the founders of existentialism. I know this is very detail-oriented, but our goal here is to be as granular as we can be so that if a student is just randomly pointed or routed to our site from another site, say a teacher says, Go to 1.1.3 of sailor.org philosophy 304. We want them to know immediately what the subject is. So I am always for drilling down very, to a very detailed level in these headings. Pascal's life. This is fine to me. The Pensees, part one, a portrait of a man. Again, these would all need to be in title case. I think that this is the title of a work. So I would ask him on that and say, you know, the title of a work. If so, it should be in quotations if an article and in italics if a book. The heart has its reasons. Again, is that a title? I would probably flag all of these and just say, are these portions of the pensées or, you know, ask him for clarity. If they are, they should be kind of more clearly labeled as such. Okay, Pascal's wager and I would probably flag this and say, do you mean this specifically with regards to Pascal, or are you zooming back out to a global level here? If the latter, you need to make that transition clear, or maybe include it in the pre-unit context. All right, I'm going to pause. Do we have any other questions at this point? Can you all still he hear me and see everything well enough? Good. Okay, great. Um, okay. So, I don't know, would you guys like me to keep going through one additional unit, or do you kind of have a sense, I feel like I've flagged sort of the major things that, that I'm kind of noticing right off the bat, but would it be helpful to go through an additional unit? Yeah, Sarah, I think we're just going to talk about blueprints um, and what I look at first. We can do a different editing training on pairing, if that's helpful.
Okay, I'm going to go briefly through one last unit just so we can have the full experience. Um, okay, so one thing I look at quickly is that I noticed that in the Blaise Pascal, he did include the dates after the, the figure's name. So that's great that he's carried that through here. And I might do a quick glance through and make sure he's done that for everyone so that we have consistency. And I can think of this while I'm doing this. Looks like he has, which is great, which makes me think that he's very thoughtful in the way he's approached this. OK, so he has done that. But that's just one of the things that, you know, if you see something done in two units, you should make sure that it's done throughout. Okay, I'm just skimming through this. This phrase already, like all good things in life, Kierkegaard, like all good things in life, appears to be modifying Kierkegaard, which doesn't make sense. So that's a quick flag. This appears to modify Kierkegaard. Can we move this to leave that face? like all good things in life. And I would just flag that because I may have misinterpreted that. Hold on, let me see what I have. I see there's some messages. Let me pause. The hyphen in a number range should be n dash. I'm tempted to give up on that since nobody does it. Uh, I would, again, defer to the CMS. So, I mean, I don't think any detail like that's too small to change. Um, and thanks for catching that. Obviously, I miss things too as well. So, I would definitely change that throughout. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. I'm reading through this. Sorry that there's a silence on my end. makes one a subject. So here I already am feeling like I'm not clear on what a subject means, if he means a subject to God. Um, I might ask him to tease that out a bit. Unexplained. So I said the term subject feels ambiguous and unexplained here. Is there any way to rewrite this? To be a bit clear. Um, I like that he's referring to Unit Seven here. I like when they, whenever they make references to other portions of the course, I feel that it sort of builds a coherence and consistency between units. So that's great, and I would say I would applaud that. This is great. The more cohesion and connectedness that you can emphasize between units better. So he's saying using the term students here again. So at this point I might go back up to the very opening and make a note that you know you'll see that I've changed students to you throughout this. Um, please make sure that you're addressing the student and I probably also indicate that in my commentary to him in my email. This stands out to me because why are fear and trembling in quotation marks? Is that a common phrase? So I'd probably ask him that. Not clear on why these are in quotation marks. Is this a common phrase used in philosophy? Any thoughts on this front? Notions uh, such as the notion, yes, you're right. Of absurdity. Okay, great. Good job, Tina. Thank you. You will be able to appraise. So I change all of that. Oh, okay. I see here fear and trembling is a work. So this needs to be clarified here in some way. So I might adjust this comment and say, I assume you're referencing Kierkegaard's work, but I think that this needs to be made a little bit more transparent somehow. So I probably adjust that comment. Um, I think that we've are, we will have already addressed the issue with appraise and assess in my global feedback, so I, I probably would just 
leave that as it is here. Okay, down into the subunits. Again, all of this would need to be in title paste and I would take that on yourself as the editor. Um, I think this is all fine. The term pseudonym seems kind of random here to me, but I think I'm assuming that it will be covered by all the readings here, but it might flag my attention in a later draft and I might say it might be good to reference what you mean by the pseudonyms. Um, and also fear and trembling. I might, you know, ask him maybe since this appears to be such a consistent theme throughout, you know, it's listed in the intro, it's listed in as a work in the learning outcomes, it's listed here. I might indicate that maybe you should mention this as a key work at some point in the intro. Um, the rest of this seems okay. Tina, let me pause. I see you just left a comment. Hold on. Should say the student, not you. Let's see that. Yep, you are correct. Um, again, be careful of the double periods. Sorry, I missed another comment. You are right. Yep, okay. Upon successful completion of this unit. So obviously we need to spend time looking at how each of these is formulated. And I apologize for moving so quickly through this, but I'm glad that that flagged your attention. I might at this point just check to make sure he has, okay, so he's done this, kind of made the same or comparable mistakes throughout. So I would probably at this point go through and edit each of them to make sure that they're consistent. Okay, and again, watch out for the double space that we changed. Okay, so I apologize I moved so quickly through the second unit, but I um, just want to wrap this up kind of quickly because I have to jump on another phone call. Um, but I wanted, I hope that um, I pointed out some major issues that, you know, right off the bat flagged my attention without even having really gone through this with a fine tooth comb. Um, it's also I just want to, you know, emphasize that usually when I'm editing, I read through, for example, a unit introduction and its learning outcomes all together and correct for grammar first. Then I loop back and think about it from the student perspective. Think about, you know, if there was an area that really confused you or, you know, as I said, you know, where they use big loaded terms and you might be totally thrown off, flag those and encourage them to be glossed and detailed. Um, okay, I just was checking to see if there are any other questions. Does anyone have any other questions before we wrap this up? I realized I kind of started to talk at the speed of light towards the end and rushed through it, so I'm sorry about that. Um, Aaron, I see you're typing, so I'll wait to see what you have to say. Oh, just a thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, I hope this was helpful to everyone. Um, I can see that I could probably spend a couple hours going through a single blueprint with you guys and really teasing it out, but I thought it would be just as useful um, to just indicate on quickly reading through this on the spot what things really st stand out to me and what I'm really most concerned in. I hope I drove home the point that I'm mainly concerned about, you know, sort of the accessibility of the prose. If as, you know, all of us are adults with um, impressive degrees and we are very good writers. So if something seems off to us or confuses us, you better believe it will confuse and you know, a, a college student or maybe a college student that's seeking remedial help. So we need to really start to make these as clear and cogent and as accessible as we can make them. And the other thing, obviously, is making things consistent across the board and adhering to the Chicago Manual of Style. So I would really emphasize those kind of three points as the main things I look for. Um, no problem. Thanks for all the thank yous. Um, 
We can definitely do trainings on other types of content. If this time seems to work pretty well for most of us, I'm happy to continue to do these at the outset of each week. I think it's an hour well spent and it's a good time for you guys to raise any concerns and remind me of what it's like to be on the ground and editing. So this has been helpful to me as well. Um, okay, great. Well, the next editor training will be this upcoming Monday at 11 a.m. and it's going to be on Moodle. So maybe we can, Aaron, to your point, kind of merge a session on editing exams with a session on how Moodle works so that we can really get into the nitty gritty of exam development. Um, and I'll send out a reminder about that as well. Okay, are there any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And